The land that time forgot. The idea of a lost world is one that really tickles the imagination. A land uncontacted by man or evolution, where the odd and prehistoric run amok. Probably the most famous version of this trope nowadays is King Kong's Skull Island and its many renditions. Now, as per usual, fiction always has some basis in reality. Of course, I can't promise you anywhere in the world you find an island of giant gorillas, but there is isolated little spots in the ocean where you can find life like no other. Meet New Caledonia, an archipelago held by France with a human population of 270,000, but the largest diversity of organisms per square kilometer in the world. It is an amazing place, filled with amazing things, but why this little set of islands? Why is this the lost world? While unlike many other Pacific islands, New Caledonia is not young rock. The various islands of the Pacific are usually the result of recent, geologically speaking, volcanic activity. But New Caledonia is much different. The main island of New Caledonia was attached to the younger Australia for most of the Mesozoic, when it was part of an all-encompassing southern continent known as Gondwana. New Caledonia eventually separated from Australia 85 million years ago, before the end of the Mesozoic and the extinction of the dinosaurs. The last contact it had with another island was 55 million years ago when it split off from New Zealand. This means the organisms here are the remnants of the prehistoric Gondwanan land, avoiding extinction by more modern species due to the island's longevity and isolation. For instance, where mammals have dominated everywhere else on the globe, here there is only one type present, giant fruit-eating bats known as flying foxes. New Caledonia creates a natural Noah's Ark of sorts, where these species who have perished everywhere else continue to thrive. Separated from the rest of the world for so long, even its fossil record is unique. The archipelago and some other surrounding lands were once home to the large terrestrial turtle Miolania, whose knobby head and dragging tail gives it a truly primeval look. As well, it was home to the Makosuchus, a scampering land-based crocodile. Both of these animals died only a couple thousand years ago when humans came to the island, which presumably led to their extinction. Now, there is still plenty of amazing life remaining on the island, but equally important to the organisms is the environment they find themselves in. Because although a smallish island, the main island of New Caledonia, known as Grand Terre, is home to a myriad of ecoregions and sub-ecoregions that have allowed the organisms to diversify. The two main regions of the island are divided along the east and west. Due to rains coming in from the east and the mountains blocking precipitation to the west, the two sides of Grand Terre have vastly different climates, the east wet and the west dry. The east is home to the rainforests of New Caledonia, home to some of the most unique arrays of plants on the planet. Endemism is a significant term to know when talking about New Caledonia. When an organism is endemic to a place, it means it's completely restricted to existing in just that place. For instance, one could say the average YouTube commenter is endemic to their mother's basement. Or that joke is endemic to overused joke landia. New Caledonia possesses a staggering five endemic families of plants, out of the 196 plant families globally. One of these is the family Amborellaceae, housing only one species, Amborella trichopoda. This small tree with inconspicuous little flowers doesn't look like much, but it is probably the closest living relative to the very first flowering plants ever, who first dotted the Cretaceous period forests millions of years ago. Another unique species is Cyathea intermedia, the tallest fern in the world, which looks like a palm tree at first glance. One main adaptation the island's plants possess is the ability to survive the island's incredibly magnesium and nickel-rich soil, which would be much too poisonous for most plants. The New Caledonia plants persist, and for their efforts, some of their sap is an electric blue due to the nickel concentration. The animals who live in these strange forests are just as weird. With the absence of mammals, lizards are one of the most dominant groups of land animals on the island, filling many niches that mammals usually would. For instance, the New Caledonian gecko is humongous, for gecko standards, reaching 35 centimeters or more than a foot in length, and feeding on insects, smaller lizards, and fruit. There are many bird species also endemic to New Caledonia. Some look and originate from birds we've all seen. The New Caledonian crow is one of these, although it's still a fascinating animal. 
The crow is possibly only behind humans when it comes to tool use intellect, using twigs for probing and the barbs of leaves for hooking small invertebrates for lunch. They even pass down the knowledge of how to build brand new tools to other crows, something even most apes aren't capable of. The Goliath Imperial Pigeon might not be as smart, but its big size and colors make it more magnificent than any rat with wings I've seen in New York. But the real poster child for new Caledonian birds is the Kagu. The Kagu is not just an endemic species, but once more a completely endemic family of bird that have gone extinct everywhere else. The Kagu's ancestors were the birds of Gondwana, and in time without any major predators, it has become near flightless, wandering the dense forests of its peaceful domain. On the other side of the island, the dry terrain is still dominated by prehistoric plant life, and divided into different regions. The region of Grand Terre, where trees grow tallest, is the dry forest, home to yet more endemic plants. The most notable of these is Ixora margaretae, a tree blanketed with fuchsia blossoms along its trunk. Birds once more are still abundant and diverse. Where trees don't dominate, shrublands known as maquis cover the terrain. The soil of the maquis is particularly toxic and combined with low precipitation, you'd expect it to be a poor habitat. But at 89% of the species in the maquis being endemic, it sports the greatest amount of endemism on Grand Terre. Species include the odd conifers known as Araucaria trees. Araucaria trees occur in other places around the world, but not to the same level of diversity seen in New Caledonia. As well, they only occur in other regions of the southern hemisphere, suggesting another Gondwanan remnant that persists on the island. There are many other subregions to the island as well. Screamside Marshes. A few eagle-eyed viewers may remember this scenery from somewhere else. The mangrove swamps are home to the Heart of Vo, a magnificent, naturally occurring child's heart. As in, like a heart drawn by a child, not a actual child's heart. And hey, this isn't even touching on the amazing reef around the islands as well. Sadly, as usual, humans have to come and mess stuff up. And I'm not just talking about those first sailors thousands of years ago. In the modern era, New Caledonia's unique geology has made it a hotspot for mining activity, which has led to habitat destruction for the life on Grand Terre. As well, humans have brought many invasive animals that the islands were once isolated from, such as cats and rats, which now prey on vulnerable animals. If we're not careful, this lost world might actually be lost forever. And that would really suck, because as I've hopefully made clear, there really is nothing like New Caledonia. Hello and thank you for watching. This is a shorter video, but hopefully you all still appreciate the information put into this one. Music is once more composed by the wonderful Dara Hughes. As usual, thanks to the images and videos I used to make this, and thank you for watching. See ya.